Okay, we can start, so. Good morning from Prague. Uh, good afternoon, evening to everyone who's virtually joining us today. Welcome to the panel on advancing the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, which is part of the conference towards a meaningful change, gendered foreign policy in practice. I'm Mila O'Sullivan from the Institute of International Relations, and I'm delighted to be chairing this panel. A special welcome to our panelists. It is an honor to have all these speakers with us today who bring incredible knowledge and experience to the table. So let me introduce the first uh, speaker, um, Jacqueline O'Neill, uh, who is Canada, Canada's ambassador on women, peace and security, WPS, as we call it. Um, next speaker will be Ivata Bassam, who is um, a policy advocacy and communications coordinator in GAPS UK, for Gender Action for Peace and Security. Next, we have with us Elena Kvarving, a seconded expert currently in the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and Lieutenant Colonel in the Norwegian Armed Forces and member of the Nordic Women's Mediators Network. She's also involved in this topic academically. We have also with us Nina Potarska, who is a social researcher and activist, and she's also the coordinator of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in Ukraine. And uh, we have Nina Bernarding, who is a director of Center for Feminist Foreign Policy in Germany. So she's joining us from Berlin. Okay, so a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining the panel. The panel is focused on, um, on marking the, on feminist foreign policy and for policy practices. It is marking the 20th anniversary of the WPS agenda. And um, in the area of foreign policy, there has been uh, indeed, uh, met, there have been many changes over the past two decades. So we can see, for example, like there are 86 countries who adopted national action plans, including the Czech Republic is currently uh, in process of adopting the second one. Our neighboring uh, Slovakia just recently adopted one. So we have feminist foreign policies about that today um, also even having a WPS ambassador with us is a sign of success. So there are many successes, but also many contestations and gaps. And I'm sure we'll hear much about it today. So we will now have a conversation for about 45 minutes, and then we will have a discussion among the speakers, but there will be also um, opportunity to take questions from the audience. So please feel free to write a question in the panel in the chat box. Or uh, there will be also an opportunity to join us uh, through video. There, there will be a waiting room for that. Um, so each panelist will now speak for about approximately eight to 10 minutes, responding to the questions, uh, some of the questions that you have in your programs, which concern the concrete steps in foreign and domestic policies uh, on WPS agenda, how to strengthen the long term conflict prevention, how to address socioeconomic inequalities, and uh, the multiple aspects of security, including economic, social, health, current health crisis, environmental threat as well. So, so um, let's start now. I will now hand over to Ambassador Jacqueline O'Neill. Uh, the virtual floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mila, and greetings everyone from Ottawa, Canada. I want to thank the Institute for convening us and uh, thank all of and greet all of our fellow speakers to everybody watching online as well and in particular the young people who are engaging on these issues. We really need you. I am just delighted to be part of today and to note, note that also joining us are my wonderful colleagues from Canada's Embassy in the Czech Republic, uh, Kim Cohen and our ambassador Aisha Recky and I know that Aisha's, uh, or sorry, Ambassador Recky is very well known to the Institute and she's just one of our finest diplomats as well as one of our top leaders within the Canadian government on women, peace and security. So you have just a tremendous resource uh, locally now. So the session of course is on advancing the women, peace and security agenda and national action plans are uh, a key way of doing that. And I'm happy to share some of Canada's experiences with our plan, as well as speak to some of our broader uh, women, peace and security, um, uh, the way that that fits with our broader efforts to define our feminist foreign policy. So, you know, a national action plan is certainly not the only way to advance this agenda, but they are important. And having spent now about 15 years trying to prompt meaningful change in institutions, I do believe in their importance. 
and they are not a miracle document. You know, they can't solve everything. And every single country, certainly including Canada, is very much learning as we go and always needing to improve. And I'm sure our, our Czech colleagues know well uh, many of the issues that I'll discuss, having been the first country in Central Europe to have a national action plan, that it's important to lead and it also brings some growing pains, let's say. So I'll answer your very wise questions, Nina, by, um, by sharing some of our experiences, but doing so very humbly and recognizing that while we have much to be proud of, of course, we very much still have gaps as well. So you asked a bit about the specific benefits and concrete steps that can be made through a national action plan. And I'll highlight just three from our experience. So the first one is that having a national action plan has led to stronger policies overall across our department. So the goal is, of course, not just to have a national action plan, but also to have one that advances the government's broader set of goals, which in our case, of course, include the goal of promoting meaningful and sustainable peace and the protection of human rights. And so supporting the abilities of diverse women to participate in decision making that affects their lives is essential to those goals. We believe it's women's rights, but it's also a way of advancing our broader goals of peace and stability. And internally to government, we really certainly benefit from engaging with broader communities, both at home and abroad, which means we have a much better understanding of our environment, higher caliber of conversations and discussions around the policy table when there is diversity at that table. We certainly don't wanna include women just for the sake of it, but we know that gender equality actually improves our analysis and our results. The second thing that we've benefited from is having a very concrete tool for collaboration with civil society. And a key change between our first national action plan and our second one, our first was in 2011, second 2017, uh, was the way that civil society was involved in the process. So in the first one, they did not have an official role. We consulted them, but it was a very ad hoc kind of process. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now they are official co-chairs of what we call our National Action Plan Advisory Committee. And this is a practice that we adopted for ourselves, but we saw other countries doing. We stole the idea from a number of other countries. And what that means is that we meet twice a year uh, co-chaired by government, everyone who's a national action plan key uh, decision maker driver with the entire network of civil society organizations that is involved uh, in that advisory group. So a network of about 80 different civil society groups. We meet twice a year to discuss progress, to share information. And we recently we've been doing things where we've had a focus on some issues and we share, we kind of brainstorm the issue. What are we going to do about it? Uh, and it, it's taken a little while to, to build the trust needed to do that, but has really, really benefited us as government. And certainly I think civil society, if nothing else, for their ability to hold us accountable. Uh, so, it, you know, the National Action Plan would sort of show those outside of government what our, ambitious, our ambitions are, uh, how we're understanding women, peace and security. And they give us, if we do it well, a rhythm for getting input and collaborating with civil society in a more predictable way. And then of course, having civil society involved has also helped our leaders uh, solidify, I'll say their political will because they know that they have a constituency that is watching. And the third thing is I'd say that it really strengthens our collaboration within government. We still sometimes have silos and people working in different departments or independently. Uh, and we can very much have much better cooperation. So as many of you know, the sort of uh, dirty secret of national action plans was that for a long time, there were two different types. One was for, we'll call them conflict affected countries. And that office often focused on domestic reform of the police or military or reconciliation. And then the other type was so-called donor countries where women, peace and security was an instrument of foreign policy or defense. And that language wasn't necessarily used internally in the country. And I think globally, we're seeing a much healthier blend of those two coming together. Uh, and that's very much the case in Canada. So in our first national action plan, we had three departments involved. Uh, now we have nine, and that includes several departments that are primarily domestically focused, like our justice department, departments working on policing and law enforcement, immigration, gender equality. And importantly, and just extra crucial in Canada is that we have two departments involved 
that uh, focus on relations with and services to Indigenous people. And that's very much a recognition that Indigenous women in Canada are much more vulnerable and much more likely to experience violence within our own country. And we have to address that. And we can't talk about women, peace and security externally without having consistent approaches and, and language internally. And so working under the umbrella of our National Action Plan has really helped us align and have mo more coherence in those policies. And I'm also, of course, very lucky that Canada created the position of ambassador for women, peace and security, because then I can share and work with counterparts and focal points uh, in countries around the world. So our work on peace, women, peace and security is also part of our broader feminist foreign policy. And I know that feminist can be a very loaded term. Uh, it is certainly controversial in Canada, too. Some people react very positively and some have negative associations. Uh, we certainly found though that with the vast majority of Canadians, uh, they agree with the thinking behind it once you have a chance to unpack it. You don't always get that chance, but once you do, it's not nearly as controversial. And so in basic terms for us, our feminist foreign policy is based on the idea that all people, regardless of their gender, should be able to have and also be able to access the same human rights and the same opportunities. And that everyone is better off when we do that, including men and boys. And so having that feminist foreign policy means we intend to have that lens in every aspect of international engagement as well. So trade, defense and security, diplomacy, assistance, et cetera. So crucial, crucial is that that approach has to be consistent with our domestic policies. And women, uh, women's movements in Canada for many years have been extremely strong and working for things like equal pay for women. So we found that we have to build upon each other, the domestic and the international. And, and you know, practically, what does that mean? I'll say, you know, for example, within Canada, from the very beginning of the pandemic, we've known that women are going to be disproportionately affected. So there's 70% of frontline healthcare workers, for example. So the majority of people in industries that are majorly affected, like retail and hospitality and restaurants. We saw enormous impact as everywhere uh, on women of schools being canceled and many women taking on more caregiving responsibilities. And we know that the home is not safe for many people, predominantly women who are facing increased domestic violence. And so knowing that from the outset, knowing to look for that from the outset really helped us shape our plans for managing the pandemic, including now looking at a national plan for childcare. Uh, and in our very first wave of response, uh, adding $50 million for domestic violence shelters. Again, our response has not been perfect. We have lots to learn and, and grow, but being attentive to this is part of the, the step. That's domestically. So internationally, then that means we also know that there are dimensions of every issue that have to be addressed or analyzed according to gender and then applied uh, with feminist perspectives. And that includes all of the biggest security issues of our times, climate, uh, you know, environment, cybersecurity, all kinds of other issues have gender dimensions. And that looks that involves so much more than just looking at whether women are present but looking at how different groups are affected, the dynamics, the power relations, and assessing how we can be useful. And I'll end by just saying, you know, for example, we've watched very closely the demonstrations in Belarus. You know, women have been the face of them and their peaceful leadership has been a central part of the story that we've heard here in Canada and internationally about them. Of course, those women are, you know, shattering stereotypes, they're shining a light on what a healthy masculinity is, what it means to be a true strong man, and they're facing great risks themselves. And so part of having a feminist foreign policy is not just thinking that their leadership is a kind of one-off or something that's unique to Belarus, but it's knowing that this often happens and it happens far too often that even when women are the majority of organizers and protesters, they're often excluded from subsequent phases of establishing governments and institutions so that we have to pay as much attention to their roles in all the next phases as we have in this one. So I'll end there. I wanna make sure that we have a lot of time for questions, but in particular to hear our other colleagues uh, and note that I know that there are a lot of challenges that we all face in, in getting this issue to go from being something that's important and good to something that's a priority. And I'm very happy in, in questions or elsewhere to talk about some of the ways that we've been trying uh, to do that at home. 
So thanks so much. I look forward to questions and discussion. Okay, thank you so much for your interesting contribution. Thank you also for uh, pointing out the important aspect of domesticating uh, NAPs, uh, uh, which is uh, to just briefly say something about the Czech context, not really the case uh, of the, the, the first Czech NAP was externally oriented and the second one will be as well. So it is quite, um, um, it, it kind of reflects the uh, res resistant environment that we have here a little bit because we are also one of the countries that didn't uh, sign the Istanbul Convention on uh, um, tackling violence against women. So uh, it, it's not really um, consistent, as you said, uh, Ambassador O'Neill. So thank you very much. And um, I will let's now bring the civil society perspective and I hand over to Eva Tabassam. Thank you. Thank you, Mila, and um, thank you to yourself and the organisers for this conference and for inviting GAPS to speak on this panel um, with such brilliant WPS practitioners. Um, so for those who haven't really heard of GAPS, that's Gender Action for Peace and Security, uh, we are the UK Civil Societies Network of Women, Peace and Security. So a large part of our role is to kind of promote and facilitate the meaningful inclusion of gender in all aspects of UK policy and practice on women, peace and security and monitor and hold the UK government to account on its commitments. Um, we, we play this kind of special role in that we're seen as the critical friend of the UK government and we work across departments. So that's with the newly merged FCDO and the MOD. Um, and we also play the role of the secretariat of the all party parliamentary group on women, peace and security. So that's separately and then that's working with parliamentarians. And I guess I just want to touch on what Jacqueline's already mentioned, and, and that's about national action plans. And what, and it's correct that that's one of the key ways that the UK can deliver its women, peace and security commitments. Um, and that's through the national action plan, which GAPS also lobbied for back in 2006. Um, they can be an important vehicle for implementation of the women, peace and security agenda, but, and we know that many states um, prioritize different aspects of the agenda and provide information on how you know, they'll act, govern their activities, fund it and monitor it. But it can be a concern sometimes if they are only setting and prioritizing aspects of the agenda that suits their state security objecti objectives um, and priorities. And we see this when we look at national action plans, as already mentioned, you know, national action plans from the global north are mostly outward looking committing to women, peace and security in terms of their foreign policy, but not really domestically, as though gender and peace and security are issues abroad and not at home. And then if you do look at some global south national action plans, they're inward looking, so addressing the domestic policy in terms of women, peace and security. And also just to add on that, those global north um, states who fund global south national action plans um, uh, well, you will see certain state security objectives and priorities reflected in that that don't necessarily come up in consultation. Um, that's just from the GAPS experience. So we do, um, <clears throat> we do need to break down the silos, and especially in the UK. In the UK, we, we, we barely make any um, kind of big commitment to win peace and security domestically. And there is no cross, I mean, as GAPS who work with the UK government closely, we don't have much contact with the Home Office. Um, and, and that's something that um, we would like to address and we do push and advocate for. And it's great to see that that's sort of happening in Canada and we hope the UK follows suit. Um, again, so NAPS do have the potential for making great concrete positive you know, gendered foreign and domestic policy, but only if the process that makes the NAP allows that to happen. So for the UK, a good example for, for, our, for our national action plan is um, consultations. So with the UK national action plan, getting consultations to form part of their process has been quite a journey. Um, there've been four national action plans so far and only three of those national action plans had um, any consultations with women rights organizations. With the first NAP, there was no consultations. Um, GAPS, of course, raised this as a concern. And then for the second national action plan, GAPS actually self-funded itself to carry out consultations um, in four focus, four, uh, four focus countries. And the, 
basically what we wanted to do was demonstrate the real importance and the need for consultations to feed into the National Action Plan. I mean, how is a National Action Plan supposed to comprehensively address women and girls' needs and experiences if there's no consultations to feed into them or no participation by them? So we get to the third National Action Plan and there's a little bit of progress uh, and the UK sets aside only 4,000 um, for three in-country consultations, which again, barely covers staff costs, but at a real push, GAPS felt that it was really important that we keep demonstrating the need for con uh, consultations. And then by the fourth National Action Plan, which is the most recent National Action Plan, the UK government actually funded GAPS to undertake several consultations with four focus countries. So we finally got there. Um, but, you know, it does demonstrate that a, for a good National Action Plan to actually concretely address the women, peace and security agenda holistically and to address the needs and challenges of women and girls, consultation is needed. You know, it, you know, it, it has shown a shift in attitude as well towards meaningful consultations. And we do hope now that this will be standard practice. And, and I guess to further illustrate that point and, and also to kind of <clears throat> show the, the work of civil society monitoring and engaging with the UK government, the UK government now, for example, last year in 2019, they funded gaps for eight global consultations to mark the 20th anniversary year this year to look at how can they implement the Women, Peace and Security agenda and then the next 20 years of the Women, Peace and Security agenda. The same with the COVID-19 um, pandemic this year, GAPS um, was funded by the UK to um, look at 10 countries, undertake consultations to, to uh, address the gendered impacts of COVID-19 and for recommendations on how, you know, um, what can the response and recovery plan be and what can the international community do? So this is one positive step and that we do hope to see women and girls, you know, at the design and implementation of policies and programmes and through their meaningful consultation and active participation. But saying that, NAPs aren't perfect. And even with consultations, there are challenges and, and challenges. And sometimes we've got things that come up in consultations. They're not always reflected in national action plans. And one thing that, um, you can see by that in the National Action Plan for the UK is in terms of conflict prevention. So quite um, <clears throat> a lot of the consultations that GAPS did, conflict prevention came up quite a bit, but that's not reflected as a strategic outcome in the National Action Plan. And what you will see in fact instead is quite a narrow um, focus on preventing and countering violent extremism and that's something that GAPS has raised concerns about and has addressed in our formal response um, in our shadow report to the National Action Plan, because this is where it shows that then it becomes actually about state agendas and priorities, rather than actually about the needs of women and girls. Um, and what we do know from rounds and rounds of consultation and the literature out there on women, peace and security is that you know, the important role that women play in preventing conflict and sustaining peace, their perspectives and experiences are really important for early warnings that can prevent conflict. So I guess on the back of that, I would argue that a key for sustainable peace and prevention, conflict prevention is the funding of women rights organisations. Um, GAPS recently worked on a paper that's due to be published next week with um, its members and country partners um, on the key to transformative change um, and that is supporting and strengthening women rights organizations and looking at modalities and how we can better support them which will better you know which will be or you know peace which will affect peace and security issues in the positive so participants from Somalia South Sudan and Nigeria noted that funding followed donor trends and priorities, as well as assumptions about the context rather than the actual needs and challenges. 
And they stressed that the importance of looking at the context rather than generalizing the criteria for funding for all organizations. You know, women rights organizations in civil society are the frontline responders who are comprehensively working on cross section of issues. Um, you know, providing right based solutions to address complex crises that we that sometimes are not necessarily aligned with donor priorities, you know, but, but they do focus on seeking conflict and gender transformations. So, for example, they might not explicitly say they're working on environmental threats per se, but they are responding to the symptoms, for example, within IDP and refugee camps, providing the essential services. So supporting and strengthening women rights organisations are always the best ways, I would say, um, for long term conflict prevention, even best ways to address socioeconomic inequalities. You know, we do need to listen to women on the ground when they put economic power and radical form on the agenda, which isn't always comfortable for donors to hear. Um, and we do need to think as practitioners of women, peace and security, what role does women, peace and security have to play in contributing to new thought and practice, especially in the next 20 years of the agenda? How do we advance the women, peace and security agenda to intersect with these emerging issues and some issues that were all that were always there but just forgotten about and and i guess on the socioeconomic inequalities on the recent covid19 project that i just mentioned that the uk government is funding that's looking at the gendered impact of covid19 you know findings again from consultations with women rights organizations um recommended that you know we need to look at the long-term economic models and they must change and they must center people and environment you know the gendered impact of covid19 has shown and in particular with in nigeria most participants highlighted that their economic development and livelihoods reduced dramatically as a result of the economic impact and you know there are job losses and reduced income opportunities and that has meant poverty has increased and 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 that's also another root cause of uh, conflict so of course this needs to be addressed in the, this needs to be addressed well too one in the short term to address the immediate and urgent needs and looked at in the long term um for you know long sustainable um and radical transformative change um so just to touch on the last bit about <clears throat> um whether foreign foreign policy practice um can tackle these gendered insecurities i mean it's hard to, to ask that to sort of answer that question because a realist would say that foreign policy by states with power in the international system can and will only gesture towards addressing gendered insecurities and that perspective says that powers and interests are so deeply embedded in foreign policy that for example in the uk embassies exist to promote uk abroad you know, UK businesses abroad. And traditionally, this was contrasted with soft issues like development and influence over values. And, and you know, we argue that the aim of women, peace and security is that you can't just separate certain parts of the agenda and we must look at it holistically. And if you're serious about security, okay, great. You need to be, but you need to be serious about the gendered nature of the effects of conflict and the gendered effects of your own foreign policy. And, I guess sometimes in civil society, you know, we have to, we ask this question like, does the UK and the international, you know, community think like that? I mean, I think there are good people and there are good initiatives, but we cannot be blind to how institutions do have interests, and and, and trade and old alliances are still kind of primary drivers of the agenda that kind of do sometimes co-opt the women's peace and security agenda. Um, so I guess we just need to look at sometimes when we when we talk about feminist foreign policies. I mean, who's feminism first? And, and, and point to like other aspects of their foreign policy, whether that's the arm trades or, you know, um, other trade parts of their um, policy. You know, there are attempts at genuine openings. They are small and imperfect, and they are a different way of conceptualizing foreign policy. Um, but, you know, that lies alongside the women, peace and security agenda being born out of the UN Security Council. And so these tensions exist and it's hard to navigate these tensions, but I think that we do need to have an open conversation with all state actors and women, peace and security, especially in the next 20 years. But I do hope that we, we hear more from women rights organizations rather than donors and their priorities. Thank you.
Thank you so much for all these important points raised. Uh, um, let's uh, now um, give the floor to Lena Kvarbing, who will bring perspective of international security organization. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mila. It is truly an honor to be here and participate in this expert panel. And especially together with Jackie that I've had the pleasure of uh, working with on a few occasions over the years. Always so good to see you. And uh, I'm excited to make new acquaintances today. I really enjoyed um, your inputs, Eva, and I'm looking forward to what the other panelists are bringing to the discussion today as well. So my maybe a unique perspective uh, comes from my background as a Lieutenant Colonel um, with more than 25, year experience, 25 years experience in the Norwegian Armed Forces, still active duty, but seconded now to the OSCE here in the Vienna. Uh, I have traditional military education and training, uh, but combined with a civilian PhD in political science, researching what factors structural, cultural and functional that prevent and promote implementation of the women, peace and security agenda and gender perspectives in the armed forces and military operations. Doing this study um, very much relates you know, to the topic of this conference towards meaningful change that gendered foreign policy in practice, implementing gender perspectives in all that we do. And the key word for me is change. And to do that, we need leaders, political and military, uh, willing and able to lead this change, not being supportive um, or issue encouraging statements uh, or even provide naps uh, if they are just uh, to be tokens. We need leaders that know the reasons for their women, peace and security and gender tasks and, and that they know how to make organizational cultural change to reach the aims of the agenda. Uh, in general, it seems being pro-women, peace and security is a popular political standpoint these days, uh, especially in a year of commemoration, 20 years since 1325. At least I think it would be frowned upon uh, to say otherwise. Um, uh, in order to be accepted by other nations, organizations, uh, and the international community, it seems important to at least express full support of the agenda. But um, how should we work then to prevent conflict, address the socioeconomic inequalities that undermine the peace building efforts, or to strengthen long term conflict prevention? Well, I think we need to be that change. We need to stop thinking, as was mentioned by Eva, uh, that it is all the others that needs fixing through our own foreign policy. If we are to be successful in creating equality somewhere else, we should make sure that we are equal ourselves within our own organizations, within our own states and societies. Like a military colleague of mine said, when I asked him if he challenged Afghan militaries while mentoring them about the need for women in the armed forces to better provide safety for the whole population, he said, uh, it is difficult to be credible when I talk to my male Afghan counterpart and say women are important in the armed forces and we ourselves have no women in our mentoring staff to show them as examples. In other words, practice what you preach. National action plans can, as has been mentioned, be a very useful tool and give legitimacy to the work, but we need more. And yes, even if we have made progress, implementation, leadership, especially accountability and consequences are still missing. We are not where we should be after 20 years. So what are the concrete steps to take to ensure that transformational potential in the women, peace and security agenda? anywhere. I mean, but first of all, starting with us. Through my research and extensive experience from working in the armed forces and now in the OSC, I find the theories of transformational organizational change like Shine and Hofstede are very helpful. They say that first of all, you need that compelling positive vision so that the change is understood to benefit the organization and its ability to achieve desired results. And for that, you need knowledge. So we need to start agreeing on status, the baseline, you know, that equal societies are more stable and have less conflict. They're more economical prosperous. 
We also know that wars are fought differently than before. Civilians are targeted. We have terrorism. We have conflict-related sexual and gender-based violence. Inequalities are amplified in war and conflict as we see now in the pandemic. And there are more, more forced labor and trafficking than ever, et cetera. And when we agree on these issues, it's easier for all of us to see the need for change and how that change can benefit us all. We also need a cultural map of the organization because you need to know how and why you do things there. What is valued? Who has the power of definition? Identity, privileges, and so on. This can be hard, but import, I mean, this can be hard, but important uh, questions because you need to know where you are in order to find the right where, way to where you're going. You need that baseline in order to later evaluate if you're moving in the right direction. We also need to make strategic choices for change, including necessary structural and process changes and personal policies. Based on that baseline I mentioned, you can make an analysis of what is needed in order to get to the end state, I mean the aim. Part of that includes ensuring organizational structures and processes are consistent with the new uh, way of thinking and working. To believe that transformation can happen without investing in quality structures uh, and processes from analysis, uh, planning, implementation, monitoring, reporting, evaluation, and consequences. I mean, it's like believing in Santa Claus. I mean, and, and that with no offense to, to Santa. Ensuring uh, also that learners are involved in the process to promote this understanding and motivate them to change because you need to educate people with power and expertise on women, peace and security and gender perspectives that promote the agenda. In addition to all the, uh, the learners knowing how to gender mainstream their agenda, uh, I mean, their area of expertise. This is an important investment. Part of that is also to create a formal and um, informal training of relevant groups and teams in which learning problems can be aired and discussed. You need to make sure that it is as safe as possible because we know that change hurts. There is a saying uh, that I really like, and it goes like, um, there is no comfort in learning and there is no learning in comfort. So in order to learn, we need to get a little uncomfortable. Try something new. So uh, for, to make these arenas for training um, uh, where insecurity is present because you learn something new, at least make it as safe um, as possible. You should also have positive role models and create a network of change agents uh, in the organization. And leadership is essential here and uh, the people with the power of definition in the organization. This, as other things mentioned, are, I mean, it is leadership responsibilities. And leaders need to be aware of their influence because their personnel will, will scrutinize what they do, you know, skin deep engagement, token actions, or just paying good old lip service to this agenda will easily be picked up on. And they then learn it is not really important. You also need to have, uh, and, and I think this is maybe one of my favorites, a clear reward and discipline system to promote change. This might sound a bit harsh, but accountability and consequences are vital. This is how we often learn, through rewards and through some kind of punishment, like lack of promotion for failing to solve the task you have been giving on women, peace and security. If it has no consequences that you fail to deliver, well, you will just continue to ignore the tasks. And that's something we've seen a lot of uh, in the Norwegian Armed Forces. Last but not least, you need monitoring and development um, and further development of the organizational culture. We all, and the special leaders, need monitoring and evaluation with you know, valid and reliable data in order to make good decisions. We generally also need reliable data for learning and for accountability. Creative reporting has definitely been an issue in the Norwegian Armed Forces, making us look better than we are, a kind of window dressing. And we cannot get away with that if we are to succeed. The Armed Forces with a legal capability to perform violence needs to be monitored uh, also by civil society to ensure a democratic control of the Armed Forces. Well, 
um, it might sound great, like we're doing all, all of this, um, and you might think it's, it's possible to just look to the north, you know, to just check with the Nordic countries to see how it all should be done. Uh, and I have to say, not, not at all. Uh, in the Norwegian Armed Forces, uh, we have no full-time gender advisors. And a lot of tasks given in the national action plans, we are on our fourth, and sometimes I wonder why we keep writing new ones we, when we're not held accountable for the first three ones. Um, a, a lot of the tasks have not been solved, but it has had, I mean, as I said, no consequences. Gender issues are still ridiculed in a hegemonic, hypermasculine culture. Gender has no status and have really not been a priority at all in the armed forces. So I believe uh, the before mentioned uh, guidelines are really good, you know, for, for leaders that want that transformational change. And if you follow them, you have a much greater chance of success. But it demands that leaders make it a priority. And that means other things will be put aside because that is, we cannot have it all. And that is what prioritizing is all about. Uh, in foreign policy, you might lo uh, lose out on a weapons deal that was, that was mentioned. Uh, you might lose out on informational relations uh, if you stand your ground on equality. But you might win security, safety, fairness, stability, etc., for women as well as men. What we have seen is um, uh, many national action, action plans with a whole uh, lot of good intentions, but lack that all important reward and discipline system, accountability and consequences. And if leaders are not held accountable for leading this change, if they're not measured in implementation, it's just not going to get done. Then we, as gender professionals, we, you know, we can push and push, uh, but progress will remain slow. So a final, was, final words for me, uh, we need to demand change. We need to demand priority and ensure that good intentions are really, I mean, followed up by real progress. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Lana Kvarin, for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, now I will pass the floor to Nina Putarska, who will bring an important civil society perspective uh, that concerns also her work on the contact line and uh, experience, direct experience with uh, an ongoing conflict in Ukraine. So thank you, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to participate in the, this conference and the comp company of the such brilliant participants. And uh, I will try to be both uh, from her and combine my experience like uh, practice uh, from my practice and uh, research and uh, the the for the five years uh, in ukraine uh, we have been able to use this uh, mechanism through the entire uh, vertical of the power but the at the same time uh, for the seven years we have been living in the conflict reality and this conflict, like a uh, bleeding, bleeding wound, uh, weeks, uh, the entire society, all society, and affects different areas of the uh, personal life. And there is uh, uh, no great destruction uh, now, but uh, in this, uh, but this uh, conflict. Uh, gradually uh, position in the uh, in the uh, whole society on both sides from the uh, contact line and uh, changing our consequences uh, attitude to the past and uh, to the future in the same time and women uh, I imagine the woman like uh, antibodies in the body when we are uh, taken uh, the brand uh, in the affected infrastructure and uh, defo uh, affected uh, social infrastructure. And uh, women activists uh, in practice, and we know uh, that war and uh, conflicts and uh, uh, in the same way, like uh, pandemia, like this uh, time of coronavirus, the women always in front of these uh, problems. And uh, of course, uh, this position like uh, women exp uh, experience 
uh, affect the security and uh, and the most vulnerable uh, groups like uh, women and girls. And uh, according to this uh, conference uh, question, like uh, how the domestic policy can be, can uh, use in the national action plan. Uh, from my perspective, the, uh, this national action plan now help us uh, to improve the communication between the local government and the uh, women uh, organization as uh, uh, obligation to to make social uh, to make official more uh, open and more attentive and more responsive and more sensitive to uh, needs uh, and uh, this is a the way to for for the women groups to push from the grassroots level uh, our uh, our needs uh, to to the local government and i think it's a great way to to change uh, situation on the local level and uh, the how how we can uh, make this uh, conflict prevention prevention on the long term perspective on my opinion uh, of course it's uh, uh, we laid the down the agenda piece uh, women peace and security on the and uh, change the concept of the security from the military and state security to the human security and uh, through the women uh, perspective and uh, women uh, socialization, we can drift, uh, make this drift from the military security to the personal and human security, and uh, which include the number of uh, characteristic, uh, new type of uh, characteristic. And uh, I can mention this, uh, it's like uh, economical uh, security, food security, uh, uh, health security, environmental security, political security, and collective security, and uh, personal security. And uh, with the help of uh, National Action Plan, we can, can improve communication, as I uh, mentioned before, on uh, this uh, local level. And uh, of course, this local level start with the, for example, which kind of road we uh, can build. We road for the cars or the road uh, with the uh, pedestrian cross uh, for the uh, people with the, with the children, for example, or uh, with the people with the, uh, who disable uh, and it's a different perspective uh, in a simple way how we can manage uh, this and how we can add our our women perspective uh, to the local level and all this about security and this is uh, how we can change uh, security implementation uh, on a very, very uh, simple level Another uh, example, it's uh, how we can make uh, our streets more safe. Maybe from women's security, we can start from the uh, light on the streets during the night time. And uh, of course, it's make uh, our women uh, security uh, more personal. And uh, of, and another uh, point is uh, women participation. And uh, the most important aspe aspect of the agenda uh, to make this participation not nominality, but uh, uh, more personality. Because uh, I notice a, a misconception 
about the uh, how how the uh, on the country level we understand this participation we uh, women participation and of course uh, how we understand the roots of the lack of this participation and uh, we like a, a women uh, network for uh, inclusive dialogue like a network of the women who participate in this uh, uh, promotion of the peace approach and uh, uh, and the participation approach in the conflict we understand this participation like uh, and lack, lack of the participation through the uh, care work and uh, lack of the care work infrastructure when the women uh, face with uh, many problem problems the lack of the kindergartens the uh, the bad infrastructure the bad uh, uh, but a uh, situation with a school when they difficult to reach uh, schools uh, and of course through this perspective of uh, care work which uh, uh, mostly in the women uh, responsibility uh, and of course the lack of this infrastructure uh, affect women uh, much more than uh, men and uh, we want to change this situation and uh, put more attention from governmental and whole society to this uh, question because this this uh, problem not uh, connect uh, just uh, with the patriarchal and uh, the sum problem we can uh, change through this uh, focus and uh, for, through this uh, economical uh, economical uh, focus for this uh, infrastructure and uh, COVID exposed many problems in the field of the care work and uh, uh, on which our state has been saving uh, many uh, saving money for uh, many years and this uh, policy of uh, reduction spends on this uh, on this uh, uh, infrastructure space we are faced with many problems after and uh, really, we are really hope uh, our government and many other governments change the focus of their attention in this uh, sphere. And uh, women, in uh, addition uh, to ordinary housework, are also forced to engage in this education of their children. After uh, our school uh, switched to the online. Of course, uh, this uh, time uh, was uh, was uh, turned to the woman uh, responsibility, and uh, identifying this problem and solving this problem it's a part of our daily work, and uh, women uh, experience of the gender socialization in a society works like a glue and they build communication and uh, like a cement and uh, uh, relationship in the community. Uh, we are trying to use uh, our potential to increase the safe space uh, for a, a woman and for a all member of uh, our society. And uh, just a reminder, last minute. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. And during the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security in Ukraine, I see repetition of the threats that the British feminist researcher Cynthia Cock Brown wrote down about maybe 10 years ago. But unfortunately, we uh, we stuck in these trends uh, 
about uh, militarization and uh, the disproportional of their uh, personal security, human security and militarization at the many years ago. And, uh, and increase uh, the, the, the focus of the, uh, in the social sphere and from my perspective of the Ha, 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 like a teacher of history, I'm uh, sure that the, the survive society can survive uh, just in the uh, approach to caring of uh, those who uh, in a vulnerable situation and make this entire society a safer at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Nina, for sharing your perspectives with us. Uh, before we go to the next speaker, here. before we go to the next speaker, just a reminder to our audience that you can write down questions to the chat box, and there will be also a discussion through video later. So now we have um, Nina Bernarding, who works on fe feminist foreign policy, which is uh, also um, closely related to WPS agenda and. Um, the floor is yours now, so thank you. Thank you um, so much and, and for inviting me and for having me uh, today. I'm really thrilled um, to be speaking on this amazing panel and um, it's it's quite hard to say something smart now after all of you have um, said so much. So so I try my best um, um, to answer also the question that you've posed and, and basically I wanna just wanna make four points and I think most of them have been raised um, before. Um, but, but the, the first one I think would be important if we talk about advancing the women, peace and security agenda in particular through NAPS in the next 20 years, for example, would be really to put an emphasis on conflict prevention. And I mean, Eva said it before, but what we see is over the last 20 years, there was a focus on um, focusing on the, um, and the strengthening the participation of women in, in peacekeeping uh, missions and in, in peace processes and um, of prevention of sexualized violence in, in conflict. And obviously this is, it's hugely important and I do not want to say um, it's not, um, but the, the fourth pillar, the conflict prevention pillar is often understand, understood as a women's participation in conflict prevention or preventing of sexualized violence and conflict. It's not understood um, as, as one pillar per se that really um, would require to look at the, the gendered drivers of, of, um, of fight and conflict. And then obviously it's no secret that there's no, it's no coincidence that this is the way because it would pose uncomfortable questions and it would also mean that gender champions like for example also Sweden um, would would reflect on, on other choices they make when it comes to foreign and security policies and I mean we are a big fan of Sweden we're a big fan of Canada for obvious reasons um, but the we've been criticizing Sweden and to a certain extent also Canada for the continuous of arms exports over the last years and we've seen for example Saudi Arabia um, both countries have exported to Saudi Arabia in the last years and and having this disconnect um, is from our perspective harmful to their gender um, in the long run. And um, this is also no, it's a common trend. I think from, from last year, the numbers from December 2019 and out of more than 18 national action plans, only 26 refer to disarmament or arms control in general. So I think this is something that when we look going forward, this is something that um, could strengthen the agenda if NAPS would actually focus um, on, on conflict prevention, including disarmament and arms export control. Um, and the and, and the ambassador you already said it addressing violent masculinities and in particular with the link um, to to um, violent uh, to armed conflict and armed violence. I think this could be something that also the national action plan could be driving throughout the whole um, foreign and security policy. Um, part of conflict prevention could also be um, <coughs> sorry, um, human security. And I think Nina, you've you've just outlined the various insecurities quite quite prominently in. Um, I, I will not go into them, but just, just two points. Um, anything related to reproductive health and rights is often considered still as a private matter um, when it comes to contraception and all of this, it's still considered not as a security threat. Um, although if we all know, it is hugely important to, to everyone who can be pregnant um, to have these services. And the same with violence against women. We just had the, the annual commemoration day and, and just an anecdote in Germany, um, intimate partner violence or dom domestic violence is um, being treated by the Ministry for Family Affairs. It's not being treated by the Ministry for Interior. And I think this actually says a lot about who you think is responsible to treat this issue and that it's a private matter and not, not a public security 
issue. And um, so I think in all of these aspects, the national action plans can, um, can be really useful as has been outlined by all of you before to not only streamlining it, but also um, posing responsibilities, who's responsible to do what. And I think this is really important. Um, and then the next point that I wanna make is if we, if we wanna move forward, I think the WPS agenda needs to become more intersectional. Um, and this has been raised by many people before, but I just wanna make one point that still the realities of LGBTQI people are still being more or less neglected in particular in conflict settings. And we know that um, be it gay men or a lesbian woman or intersex um, people, they are, they are targeted at least specifically in and after conflict. And the, the violence that they experience and also the, um, the, the discrimination in general obviously stems from the, from the same source that women's um, discrimination and violence against women stems. And, and I truly believe that we can only um, advance the women, peace and security agenda if we really address all these in, um, intersectional um, insecurities. Um, and, and the third point that I wanted to make is, and it has been said by Eva and also by the ambassador about institutionalizing civil society. And we have seen a great progress over the last years in particular when it comes to uh, monitoring and um, the, there have been more, as, as you said, for example, in Canada, there has been the advisory group, there are co-chairs now. I think that's a very important point. Um, unfortunately in Germany, uh, we are still very much um, behind in this regard, I would say. Um, civil society has a role in monitoring, but for example, we do not have a role in either um, designing the national action plan or evaluating it. And I think these are two crucial aspects that um, should change in, in the future. And I think in particular, this having an independent evaluation by civil society um, is something that can really benefit. And if you then also fund this independent civil society evaluation, I think then it would be even uh, much better. Um, but beyond this institutionalizing civil society in the concretely in the national action plans, I think ensuring that feminist civil society is um, that, that governments work with civil society in, in international fora and, and what we've seen, and I think you've also mentioned it in your, at least in the documents that you've sent to us, Mila, is that we've seen a global anti-gender um, campaigns that are really working to dismantle the women's rights agenda and the rights of political minorities. And with, for example, anti-gender actors like the Heritage Foundation, they have been part of the official US delegation to the, con to the Commission on the Status of Women in the Paris. So we really need to balance this. We need to make sure that feminist civil society have access to these fora and also can work with governments and support governments in pushing this. We have seen the pushback also manifest itself in the ninth, um, when the ninth uh, WPS agenda was, um, um, was passed in the UN Security Council in, in April 2019, when the US pushed to exclude previously accrued language on reproductive health um, and rights. And I think if there's a better coordination between governments and, and civil society before the resolutions are being put on the table in these fora, there can also be much better, um, more public pressure. And I think there's a really benefit in also in looking at this. We see something similar at the OSCE uh, Ministerial Council at the moment who has been um, I think the meetings today, yesterday and today, and um, we know that from many of the declarations that are being put to the table, Russia and the Holy See have been doing their best to actually push out any language on, on gender or gender equality. If we're lucky, we get something on the, the impact of women, uh, of violence or the participation in projects, but anything related to gender is out. So, and I think if civil society, we do not have access to the OSCE Ministerial Council, but I think if there's a coordinated cooperation before this, I think we can, um, we can be, really be of help um, because we know that a lot of governments really try to do their best. Um, and then just really briefly, lastly, and I think Eva already uh, mentioned it, but like fund feminist civil society. Um, we've, we've seen The Guardian published last year a piece um, that said, and I have the figures here, that from in 2016 to 2017, 1% 1 of all gender focused assistance went to women's rights organization. So we see on one hand that there is an increased willingness to fund gender equality, but it's going to other governments or, or um, international organizations. And um, the, the Association for Women's Rights and Development they've published, I think also um, this year, saying that the, the median budget of a feminist organization is $20,000 a year. And only 1% of the whole development corporation last year went to women's rights organization. And if I compare this with Open Democracy did a really good piece at the end of October this year, 
they've highlighted how only 28 anti-gender civil uh, anti-gender think tanks and NGOs that most of them have ties to the U.S. to the Trump administration. They spend almost 300 um, billions of dollars, million, sorry, um, um, in outside of the U.S. in the last 13 years to restrict women's rights and the rights of LGBTQI people. And if we just she, if we just see this amount of disconnect of funding, then it's I'm sometimes surprised that we still actually have the right to vote. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm really concerned about the state of affairs when it comes to women's rights and the rights of political minorities. And I think the women, peace and security agenda, because it is a government agenda and it should stay one, um, is, is really important for us um, to, to also um, coordinate against this, this international backlash. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for all these contributions. There has been so much said that um, a lot of uh, concrete practices and tips. So um, would you like to comment on each other's what has been said or there, there's been a lot of said about state centrism, about the need to focus on human center approach, a lot about domesticating NEPs, about arms trade, about this consistency. Um, a lot has been said also about the uh, style of thinking and about um, a need to focus on socioeconomic issues. So if you would like to perhaps uh, comment on each other's uh, speeches. Uh, shall we um, start with uh, Ambassador O'Neill or uh, is it okay or would you like would you have Sure. I'm happy to go to questions too. I, I'll just say really quickly that, um, you know, I think what a number of speakers referenced is something that um, is very, very clear to so many of us, which is that saying that you're in favor of women, peace and security, as Lena mentioned, is very politically popular right now. And I think most people around the world have been trained at this point on the right words to use. And that for us as advocates and internal champions means we've had to really refine our approaches and look a little more um, at some of the more subtle ways. So we see things now like um, people saying it's a priority but not funding it. You know, <laughs> Lena mentioned that Santa Claus, we have our, our ambassador to the UN says, a plan without a budget is like a, is actually a hallucination is what he said. So they're not funding it or they're putting it in committees where it's going to have a die a slow death um, or they're bringing it in at the very, very end of a process, not in the planning stage or they'll, people will suggest to have one event that's not tied to anything else in the organization and then never do another event again. So I think the concept uh, that Lena in particular mentioned about consequences and impacts on career advancement and all kinds of other issues are really, really important because we've definitely moved into a phase where the resistance uh, in many places just looks different than what it might have before. Um, would Ivata Basant like to uh, comment on what has been said? Okay. Yeah, sure. I, I guess ex exactly what Jacqueline said and, and everybody else has said, and we have to move past lip service. Um, <clears throat> and that's um, move to real implementation of the agenda, uh, and that's looking at the, at the agenda in its entirety. Um, and with national action plans, I mean, it's great that there's so many national action plans that exist, but we're, there's no money being accounted for these activities to take place. So um, national action plans need to account for funding, a dedicated pot of funding to women, peace and security. Um, and we're not seeing that at the minute. And, and just to echo what Nina said, less than 1% of money towards gender equality goes to women rights organizations. So we need donors and member states to put money where their mouth is basically and, and get dedicated funding to women, peace and security. Okay, thank you. Would uh, Lena Kvarling like to comment? Yes, very briefly. I, I just have to say that I really enjoyed all of your presentations. I thought they were very inspiring and uh, it's great to, to be able to participate at events like this. And, and, and because working with this, you also need inspiration and I got that today from you. So thank you. Uh, I. I really also uh, wanted to say just a, a brief thing about uh, the OSE was mentioned by Nina that we struggle with getting the right, the declarations. 
at the same time, I have to say, coming from Norway, you know, and in, in a very equal society, uh, I'm, I'm impressed in the, uh, with the OSCE uh, at many levels that they actually were, do a lot of the work on the ground. The declarations might be hard, but we're still working very hard on including this in projects. I've had leaders be open to to one on one, um, uh, you know, mentoring on gender issues, and and that has impressed me. I mean, I've I've been here just a few months, and I'm leaving uh, New Year, but but there are important work being done on the ground. But we still struggle with the declarations. Thank you. And, and just to to make one thing, obviously, I know this, and it's. The, Sometimes it's also really hard to, I mean, it's not hard, it's easy to be in a civil society position, but we always focus on what's negative. We rarely focus on what's positive, although we do see this. So I just want to make this sure. Okay. I'm happy to be there because uh, most of uh, my presentation of, uh, according to this issue, it's uh, always struggling with the main issue of uh, uh, militarization and uh, government security. And now I feel uh, very comfortable with the uh, uh, partners on <laughs> this issue and it's uh, really difficult to add uh, something else uh, because we cover I think this issue from different sides. Thank you for all of us. <laughs> and would Nina also like to comment or uh, okay let's move to the questions. We, we have several questions from the audience. Um, the first one is um, uh, in the Czech Republic, gender equality is still, still not inherent in our everyday policies. So how can uh, we effectively, effectively promote it somewhere else? And if, you, if we can get, go over another question at the same time, uh, that's more specific. Uh, how can young women students get involved in feminist foreign policy? Because that is an area which is really still marginalized. So if you can go over the, those two questions, thank you. Let's start with again with Ambassador O'Neill. Thank you. Sure, and Mila, maybe we could also hear from you on the uh, checkpoint because you're uh, certainly more, you have much deeper knowledge than um, than we do on that one. Um, so, really briefly on the on young people and and youth peace and security is now there is now a movement as well. There are many many young people working on peace and security connecting it in some ways to women, peace and security, but also identifying on its own. And it's been really excellent to watch because we're hearing people talk about both the process and the issues. And the issues people are raising things like, you know, that young populations are meant to be viewed as resources and have so much to offer. They're not just risk factors. So too often we've talked about young people as well, there are many, many young men and they're vulnerable to recruitment by extremist groups. And so we have to prevent that. We're not seeing the positive resource that young people are. Uh, and then this year has also been really fun in many ways because we've done a lot of intergenerational work around the world. So some of the founders of this movement with young people and, one, and I'll, I'll answer the question about how to get involved, but one of the things that's really struck me is that we have really different ways of thinking about getting involved. So many of the young activists that, um, that I've been at round tables with have been saying to many of the you know, founders of the movement, you look to us and say, do you have an organization? Do you have a chair, a secretariat? Do you have minutes from your last meeting? Do you have a membership list? You know, all the more formal ways that we're used to people in, uh, being engaged, whereas younger people would say, no, we, we mobilize people through social media on specific issues. They turn out, then they, you know, then when we need them again, they, they mobilize again. So even the formats of our coming together are different. So I'd say, uh, you know, in Canada, there's a, now a coalition of um, youth activists in peace and security. You can, they're on Twitter, you can find them there. They do not have a website because that would be something that we would do is start with a website and then go to Twitter. Um, and then just finding leaders in the youth peace and security movement. Uh, you can certainly look on online for many of them uh, and they're doing really great, great work. So highly encourage young people to get much more involved in this and recognize that we also need to come to you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. If uh, Eva Tabassam would like to uh elaborate on the question, answer the questions that uh, about the need to have consistency domestically and abroad or feminist foreign policy. 
Thank you. Um, I would say uh, on the gender equality um, in the general public, I mean, yes, I, I think I agree. I think really you're probably in a better place than most of us to say that. But I do think two things can exist at the same time. So you can effectively promote gender equality at home and abroad. Um, and, and that's all I will say on that. Um, and then in terms of the second question on how can young people get involved? Well, I'd like to consider myself a young person still. <laughs> um, and I would just say, I mean, for my experience, how I, I mean, I'm not, I don't, I, I guess I, I, I don't necessarily like the term feminist um, foreign policy because, you know, this, I mean, a variety of things and, and so on. But I guess in that sort of area and that women, peace and security area, how I got into it was very much through activism um, that was um, being involved in my local, um, you know, I'm a Labour member. So I was involved in my local party uh, group. That was, um, I used to also volunteer at Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Um, I would be involved in diaspora groups um, and then through my university as well and, and, and I guess it was just my activism and my experience and my lived experience and, and, and wanting to kind of um, pursue that further and, and, and that's sort of how I ended up in this area and I know and I would just um, yeah echo what Jacqueline said as well social media is really good to find out what's going on in your area and in other areas and you know there are like groups that meet up and you know one good thing that has Sort of come out of the pandemic is everything's online now so there are more discussions happening and more like breaking down of like what's going on and how can we make change and you know what are the issues that are really pertinent at minute and so on so um, there is stuff out there and and then of course the young um the youth peace and security agenda as well that's um you know becoming a bit more um alive now i mean it was there in like i mean it was referenced in the women peace and security agenda a resolution and, and, and a lot of people are focusing on that and there's this connection between the both and lots of members are for gaps members sorry like plan they're working on both things and trying to get youth involved a bit more so it's just trying to um you know what insert yourself and shove those doors down and um putting yourselves um there and saying you know we want the floor we want to get involved okay thank you very much um we are almost running out of time, so if uh, we can have some brief remark, last brief remarks, uh, go to Lena Corby. Yes, I just wanted to comment very briefly uh, is the last final words for me and, and that goes out to the young people out there uh, is that we really depend on, on your engagement in this and I am so impressed by many of these young people. They know so much more than I did at that age uh, and it's it's refreshing to see and and for me, I, I've tried to support that engagement with whenever students have contacted me for information or or, or, or whatever I can contribute with. I, I That's my way of trying to, to contribute to to the, to the younger community and, and to help them um, engage in this um, in these topics. So uh, I'm rooting for the young people here and uh, and uh, because we're relying on you going forward. So thank you. Thank you very much. And Nina Potarska, would like to? Uh... Yes, thank you. As an activist, and I will try to, uh, to, to answer the pre previous question and finalize my speech. And um, as activist, I do not wait for invitation. Uh, I go by myself. <laughs> and, uh, but of course, uh, participation requires uh, the author uh, authorities to turn uh, their heads in our direction. And uh, in addition, this uh, um, UN uh, reporting system is also open and uh, where you can also find the platform and uh, space for communication uh, between other uh, women's uh, organization. And uh, also for this, you need to unite uh, in women groups and uh, to be louder and more visible. And NEPS, NEP, uh, NEPS gives us uh, opportunity, but it's not ideal way, but uh, it, it can work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, last, uh, Nina Bernadine, thank you. Um, I can also be really brief. Um, I think ask questions and do not be discouraged when someone tells you you are naive or you don't have enough experience. Just question the assumptions that our entire structures and systems are built on because they're patriarchal and exclusive in itself. And this whole making you doubt yourself is, is part of this system. So. 
um, yeah, just be persistent, I think is, is my very um, unconcrete suggestion. And then just for students, a very concrete one, I can just really recommend um, this book. It's called Sex and World Peace. And it's, it's really easily written. It's, it's a mixture of quantitative and qualitative analysis. And it's just great um, that I wish I had when I studied. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So sadly, we are out of time. So let me end the panel by say, saying thank you so much for the rich feminist discussions today. And thank you for sharing your thoughts with us and uh, working on, on the WPS agenda. So thank you once again to Jacqueline O'Neill, to Lena Kvarding, uh, Nina Potarska, Nina Bernatik, and Eva Tabassam. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you also to our audience for joining us. Um, and if you can, please stay with us for the other two panels, which is on development and on sexual and reproductive health rights. So thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Thank you, Mila. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>